Welcome back to the ASP.NET MVC series here on TechPub. In this episode, I'm going to dive deep into web security with ASP.NET MVC 2.0. And it's easy when talking about security to have it veer off into a lecture, putting the audience to sleep, or as is more common, diving into deep technical details that accomplish the same thing, a snoring audience. Security is very important, so I want to lead off with a punchline today, and then we'll get into some good ghost stories, which is that the MVC framework does a lot of things to protect you, but it doesn't do everything required for a secure site. You need to implement a number of things in order to stay secure. So I'll dive into these with lots of code today, showing you various issues that can crop up if you're forgetful, which most of us, especially me, tend to be when we are busy. The topics I'll be covering today are most likely ones you've heard before, but my goal is to put them in context uh, with the MVC framework. These topics are cross-site scripting attacks, otherwise known as XSS, social engineering and the right to users' privacy, form spoofing, and cross-site request forgery. I'll also lead off with the practices you can use to avoid these attacks, which I'll show the code for in just a moment. But the first thing that you need to keep in mind is, of course, never trust data from anywhere, especially your own database. As we're about to see, it's all too easy to compromise access to your database should you, as the administrator, ever lose your password, which does happen. It's very easy to forget to encode output to your views, leaving open the door for XSS attacks. Your best bet is to not use the Web Forms View Engine, which does not encode by default, and instead use one that does, such as Spark or Enhamel. Never trust any data that comes into your application. This includes cookies, query string values, things from the header, anything that you can read in from the outside, everything is suspect. Now, it's pretty easy to steal the forms on a website by copying the HTML and running some type of scam or attack on a site that you create or to combine that with XSS to perpetrate a cross-site request forgery attack, which I'll talk about in a minute. You can mitigate these issues by using an anti-forgery token, which is a feature of ASP.NET MVC. Never trust any data coming into your site, even data that is validated with an anti-forgery token. Clever manipulation of the form can overload model binders and allow attackers to alter things you don't want altered. You want to respect your user's privacy and store only the information that you need. Saving address information because you might need it is not a good practice, especially if you lose it later on. You'll have a bit of explaining to do. Part of respecting a user's privacy is also to push them to use strong passwords that cannot be guessed. Finally, did I mention to never trust any source of data? Here is our demo application that I'll be using for today's examples. And putting my security hat on, one of the first choices I need to make is how I'm going to be storing user information. Now, if you're going to be working on an intranet application and you can hook up to Active Directory, by all means, use that. Or if you have an LDAP system, use that. A lot of corporate people also have a legacy uh, membership system. And if you have to, of course, use that. But if you do have a choice and you're sitting around wondering, should I use ASP.NET membership? Should I roll my own? What should I do? Uh, by far, the answer is just use ASP.NET membership. Rolling your own can only get you into trouble, unless, of course, you have one that you've been using for years. But let's assume for this example that you're going to use ASP.NET membership, which is a very good decision. And we'll see why right now. If I open this up, I can scroll on down and we can take a look at the settings that the team has put into place for you. Let's collapse this window over here. And here is the membership provider uh, set up for you. And one of the great things that they've done straight away is to set the password format to hashed. This is a one-way encryption. Uh, they salt it and hash it, so it is uh, pretty much unencryptable, uh, undecryptable, excuse me. And what you uh, want to make sure is that you leave this unhashed unless you have a darn good reason uh, otherwise. Now, a lot of people like to have the functionality that you can do a password uh, retrieval. And if you do that, just know that usually attackers can spoof that and go through some question and answers uh, and also hijack emails and steal that password. So let's get this all set up. First thing I want to do is to change the application name. And so what I think I'll put in here is TechPub Demo. 
Next thing I want to do is to change the required password length to 8. It's been shown that if you bump this just by two characters, uh, you will strengthen that password a lot. Uh, this is a very nice feature right here. It will lock a user out and we'll leave it at 5. Uh, this prevents someone from attacking a login process using a uh, jammer or cracker that can jam passwords and try and guess over and over and over. That was another way that Twitter was recently hacked. Okay, the minimum required non-alphanumeric characters is set by default to zero. Let's change that to two. Uh, the reason you want that is that if you sprinkle numbers inside of what would otherwise be a guessable phrase, this makes it that much harder. If you want something a little bit stronger and you can't make this combination of settings work for you, I might suggest you go online and you look for a regular expression to use or you develop your own. This is just a matching expression so that when users enter a password it has to match this regular expression and then they can go in. You can do things in here like demand certain level or certain amount of uppercase and you can also make sure that numeric uh, sequences are not sequential such as password 123, which would fit this exact requirement we have right here. All right, well, the last thing you want to do is to come up to your forms authentication here, and you want to set the path of the cookie. And we're going to set this to forms auth. There we go. Okay, we have now set up the authentication system. It's nice and secure. Uh, I would really push you to leave the password retrieval feature off. Uh, if you turn it on, it will make you turn the password format to encrypted or clear. Uh, encrypted is uh, not always very safe because if someone manages to, gra manages to grab the data, they can decrypt the password, and that is not a good thing. So let's take a look at what cross-site scripting looks like, and what I'm going to do right now is to deface the home page of my demo application. And the first thing I need to do is to remove the safeguards put in by the team, and that is HTML encoding, as you can see right here. There we are. Outputting HTML begin form, which opens the form. Then we have a text box here. Uh, remember from the views uh, episodes that if you name an uh, input element the same as a view data item, then you are working with that view data item straight away. That's the way the model binders work. Okay, so I can save this. I now have my form. There's one last thing I need to do, which is to disable a feature of ASP.NET that has been carried over to MVC 2.0, and that is automatic page validation. And to see this in action, let's run this page. And what we can do here is to enter in some malicious script in this value. Pin something like script, and then something like alert, hello. And disable that. There we go. End that. Okay, good. So I hit go. What's going to happen here is that ASP.NET is going to see that a potentially dangerous request.form value was detected from the client and it's going to stop it in its tracks. I need to go into my controller and I need to disable the validation. And they do just that for the entire controller. And I think you've probably found yourself doing this before. We'll say validate input and we're going to turn this off. Say false. Okay, we are now uh, not protected on the server side. So what I'm going to do here is just add in a real quick switch and say request.form and then we can say message and then we use the null coalescing operator. So now if we put our script back and Chrome remembers it for me, I hit go. What I get to see here is some JavaScript that was run by our page, which is how XSS attacks are perpetrated. Now you might be thinking, hey, wait a minute, popping up an alert message, that is not that big of a deal. But what I could do instead of that is I could say something like this, source equals, and I link off to my site, which is a really bad site.example.com that has some really bad JavaScript file in there. And that really bad JavaScript file could scrape the cookies off the browser that it client has right here could do worse. Well, now that we've defaced our home page, how do we go about protecting ourselves? And usually when it comes to cross-site scripting, the answer is encoding. Now, of course, that's not the answer for everything, uh, but it is a great start. And you want to make sure that you encode everything that you output. So let's take a look at how we would do that. The first thing, of course, we need to do is to get away from validate input false. 
Now, if you need to accept HTML in, I'll show you a way to do that in just a moment. So we want to make sure we validate the input moreover. I want to come back here and wrap this up with HTML.encode. This is going to encode the output. In other words, remove all of the reserved HTML characters that allow the attack in the first place. And it's going to put it out onto the page as if it were HTML. And turning off the validation really quickly, just so you can see how encoding works, if we come back to our page and rerun this. There we go. And we're going to hit go. And this time what shows up is the encoded string. HTML.encode works great. However, you have to remember to put it in, which for some developers, including myself, well, sometimes we forget, and it is not good to forget. So your best bet is to remove the web form's view engine. Now, this is not a declarative statement uh, against the functionality of the web form's view engine. It's quite functional. However, it's not safe by default in terms of HTML encoding. There's no way to override the current settings. You have to actually go in here and invoke a method to encode by default. Now, if you use a view engine like Spark or Enamel, which are very, very capable, you can have those turn on encoding by default. Back in 2008, Jeff Atwood, who is the owner and operator of Stack Overflow, found out the hard way how XSS can bite you. And it turned out that someone had manipulated the avatar in their profile. And every time that user's avatar showed up on one of the pages on Stack Overflow, well, it turned out that it was stealing users' cookies. And it did this by a clever XSS attack that the user was able to inject into their image URL. It basically cut the image URL off, injected some script. That script went, grabbed the user's cookie, and sent it off to another site. Well, that one of the cookies included Jeff's own cookie, and the user, when they saw this, said yippee-i-o, basically hijacked Jeff's cookie and logged into the site as him. Seems far-fetched. It certainly is not. Well, the lesson learned here is twofold. Number one, don't write your own sanitizer. Make sure you use HTML and code. Don't forget. And moreover, make your cookies HTTP only. Now, you might be wondering why in the world did Jeff decide to write his own sanitizer? And the answer is that he wanted to allow his users to input HTML in their bios and the answers and other places as well. He was sanitizing HTML. Unfortunately, not as well as he should have. Well, the truth about it is you certainly don't need to write your own routine if you do want to allow HTML. You certainly can do that, and I will show you how to do that right now using the anti-XSS library. You can find the anti-XSS library up at CodePlex at anti-xss.codeplex.com, and you might be wondering, why do I want to use this? And the answers are that uh, it's got a slight performance benefit over HTML.encode. Not only that, but you can sanitize uh, HTML entries so that only HTML is input and all other badness is scraped out. There are also other things you can do with it, like XML encode and JavaScript encode. And it's a little bit more aggressive with the way that it encodes the HTML output. Uh, it will encode it for JavaScript, HTML, and XML all at once by default, which is great. Or if you don't need it all done at the same time, you can have it do it individually, which I'm about to show you. Now, once you hit download, it takes you over to the download site where you get to download an MSI. It'll install the binaries as well as some examples and a help file onto your hard drive. So I'll be using the anti access library.dll for the examples I'm about to show. And this is stored in your program files, Microsoft Information Security, and then in the Microsoft Anti-Cross-Site Scripting, blah, blah, blah. So, right, we need the DLL, we take this out, open it up, good, we have the library in here, we are set and ready to go. Okay, well, how do we use this? Well, one of the things that you're going to need to do if you want to encode anything is you need to call on the HTML helper and you need to say encode. Well, what we can do is write our own extension method, and what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to write a number of these things. Um, I'm going to write inside of my helpers directory here a new helper class. Let's create that, and I'm going to call this new class, and I like this name actually. If I go over here, I'm going to call this my XSS helper. Isn't that a fun name? Okay, so inside of here, we got to, of course, make this class static. There we go. And then what I'm going to do is I'm just going to set this to system.web.mvc so it gets shown on the page itself. Anti XSS controlled period. That adds a using reference up there. And then I say 
Wow, look at all that right there. HTML in code. Now see all these other things you get. This is why a lot of people like this library. JavaScript in code, URL encoding, XML encoding, VB script encoding, which is kind of cool. So one of the things that I'm going to show you in just a bit, minute here is get safe HTML. For right now, I'm just going to say HTML in code, and then I'm going to give it the input. There we go. Okay, well great. So now back here on my page, if I wanted to use this new library, I can simply just say HTML dot H. And then, wow, what can I put in here to test this? Well, that's the other cool thing about this library. After you install it, uh, you will have access to this groovy tool inside here, the test harness. Okay, well, this is the anti-XSS test bench. And if I open that up by double clicking, and it needs to have that run, yes, great. You can see it's a console application. It's saying, what do you want me to do? And I want you to do some XSS validation. And the cool thing is, what it's going to do, as you saw there, is it outputs a bunch of blah to the screen. Now that's kind of neat, so if I want to take this whole thing for a spin, I could simply come in here, I can copy this, go back down over here, and well, avert your eyes for a second because I am simply going to put some code in line here. Right. So that is a bunch of really gnarly XSS code here, and what I can do is just simply encode this right there, great. Okay, well let's run this and see how our encoder action works. And if I load up the page, right, well, you can see that it encoded it nicely. Well, that's what we did expect, I suppose. But what if we wanted to do something a little bit different? I mean, a lot of times, uh, sites will allow, like Stack Overflow and Hack Overflow, will allow you to put in well, some basic HTML. Well, let's take a look at that case. Well, the encoder is working really well, but what about the case where you want your users to be able to put in, well, some basic HTML? Perhaps you want them to add links, images, and other things. Well, in that case, what we could do here is we could use the get safe HTML method of the anti XSS library. So, to show that in action, let's go back over here to our helper. What I'm going to do is simply copy and paste this existing method. And instead of this, I'm going to call it safe encode. There we go. Okay, and then what I need to do inside here is just change this method to get safe HTML. There we are. And what get safe HTML is going to do is it's going to take a look at the input, decide if it's safe or not, and then it's going to strip out any unsafe characters, anything with scripts or anything it determines to be bad. What I'm going to do is I'm going to create a brand new string and I'm going to call this safe and I'm going to enter in some HTML. And I'll just say, oh, hi. Great. And let's end this off. There we go. All right, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to simply output this in encoded fashion, and I'll just say html.h, and I'm going to put it safe. Okay, so let's run this and see how this looks. And what we should see is straight up HTML puked out on the screen, and we do. Okay, good. Well, now, what if I want to be able to enable that to be shown on the screen uh, and get a level of safety? Like, okay, I can show this safely. Uh, it's input from my database, perhaps. Uh, let's do this instead of html.h. I'm going to use our new method, safe encode. And if I come back over here to our browser, and there we go, and we refresh this, and now what we get is great. We see grid old HTML. Okay, well, does this really work? Let's go put it through its paces. Instead of having this in here, let's embed some script, some nice malicious script with a alert and say hi XSS. Great, and then we'll end this. Okay, and we'll save it. Well, will this pop up a problem? And let's find out. We'll go back to our browser, refresh this, and what we see is nothing. This is interesting because it doesn't encode the value and stick it out here. What it does, if we come in here and view the page source and come down here, what it does is actually remove it entirely. So I still have the same message. Cross-site scripting is a massive problem that is enabled by developers either not knowing or forgetting to encode their output and attributes and other things. So anything that you can do to prod yourself into remembering, or better yet, just do encoding by default is a good thing. In fact, I would nudge you over to the uh, episode number six on view engines where we plug in the uh, Spark view engine uh, into MVC. And as I've been mentioning, you can turn uh, encoding on by default using Spark. 
which probably is one of the safest routes you can go to keep your application safe. Users are absolutely blown away when they find out how easy it is to trick a user into giving up information about themselves in order to discover a password. It's also incredibly easy to do some investigation on key users of your system, including administrators, in order to guess a password. Not only that, but getting a site to divulge information about a user in order to get into that site is increasingly easy. Put all these things together with services from other websites and you have some devastating social engineering and trickery that will allow people in to your site, posing sometimes as an administrator and when they're in as an administrator, the sky is the limit in terms of the damage that they can do. Back in 2008, Reddit lost a whole bunch of its data uh, while backing up some of its servers and evidently the backup tape was left at the data center. It's a simple oversight and usually one you can recover from. You just have to run the backups one more time. And in evaluating what had happened, Reddit simply said, whoops, we're sorry, and remarkably suggested that there was no personally identifiable information present in those backup tapes except for logins, usernames, and emails. And the story gets worse, as unfortunately the Reddit developers decided it would be okay to store passwords in the clear, not encrypting anything at all. When confronted about this, the Reddit developer who made the decision said it was for functionality for the users. We did it for the users. Unfortunately, he did not consider what loss of that data would mean. And on the face of it, it doesn't seem very apparent. Big deal, Reddit's just a comment site, so they lose a username and password, it doesn't get changed, so someone comes in and comments as a different person. Well, what else could happen? What could happen if I, as a hacker, got my hands on this data? Well, here's my brand new Reddit hard drive, full of lots of usernames and passwords, including email accounts. So if I put my black hat on, let's see what kind of damage I can do. The first order of business would be to import all of the data that I found into some type of database and maybe loop over those accounts and see which emails in there belonged to Gmail. And then I might try and go log into Gmail using the exact password that is stored in clear text in those databases. Now, odds say that if users are true to form and don't use unique passwords in various sites, well, I bet I'll have at least one to a hundred matches. Well, the other thing I can do, besides logging into people's Gmail accounts, is I can look for names in there that I recognize, names that might have powerful positions somewhere else, names that I could use for a bit of a cross attack. In fact, I know of a Reddit user that might make a very interesting target. Back in 2009, Jeff Atwood found himself on the wrong end of a very curious mind that had stumbled onto some interesting information. Now, Jeff got lucky. This nice person decided not to wreak havoc on Stack Overflow, but what happened was that this person was working on a project, found a database full of information that was easily decryptable, managed to find Jeff's login, and then reversed the encryption and got his password. Now, let's just pretend that user was me and that uh, I had Jeff's account information in the Reddit database and I was able to use the exact same password stored in clear text and go and log in as him in Stack Overflow. Now, of course, that is not the case. However, information mining like this is pretty simple. You could probably find the SQL for that Reddit backup somewhere online, some hacker's forum. Point being is, it's pretty easy to take compromised information about a user, like Jeff, and then use it somewhere else where you can do some real damage. Now it's worth saying at this point that this is the second story in this episode involving Jeff, and it might seem like I'm picking on him a bit, when that could not be farther from the truth. I am very, very grateful to Jeff uh, for his service to the community, for blogging the things that have happened to him that we can all learn from. Now if you're breathing a sigh of relief, thinking, whoa, good thing I didn't sign up with Reddit, well, don't worry, I am sure there is another site or 20 out there that is storing your password in clear text, just waiting to see the light of day. But encrypting your password or hashing your password is no guarantee against someone guessing it. And let's face it, we're all human. We need to remember these passwords when we want to go and log into our favorite sites. So we typically will not use unique passwords per site. 
Instead, we'll probably have a set of four or five or six, maybe, passwords that we'll use. These passwords might typically follow along a theme. That has been at least the result of password studies among geeks. And all it takes is a little bit of uh, snooping to find out what those passwords might be. Let's see how easy it is. In the age of information, it is all too tempting to share way more online about yourself than you should. Now, on the face of it, things like Facebook and Twitter, maybe a blog of yours, you know, what are you sharing? After all, you're sharing your thoughts and ideas and so on. Uh, but to a person who is adept at social engineering, these things are a gold mine. So let's put on our evil hat and see what we can come up with here. The first thing I'm going to do is refer back to a post I read on onemansblog.com where he talks about how I'd hack your weak passwords. Now, uh, this guy basically put this information together based on things that he's read on security notices and so on, but it's pretty much the primer for anybody out there who wants to pull off some social engineering. Partner's name, child, pet's name, uh, number replacement, easy stuff, uh, four digits of social, and then you got sequential numbers, of course, password, which is the Twitter server password. Password, isn't that great? City, college, football team name, date of birth, and some catchphrases. Okay, well, to illustrate how you can do all this, I've decided to pick on a good friend of mine. And the reason I'm going to do this is a couple of reasons. He's the administrator of a very big site. It's a fictional site, of course. But if I can guess his password, I can get into his site. Now, it's not really him I'm after. What I really want to do is get into his site so I can go and cause a little mischief. And the site that he runs is, as I mentioned, a very big one. Uh, it does some data-driven stuff with some CMS. If I can get into his database, then I can plant some XSS and I can cause a lot of pain for people. So let's see what we can do. And of course, the person I'm talking about is the administrator of Hack Overflow, Mr. MVC himself. Now, as we all know, Hack Overflow is a very, very big site. And what I need to do to get in there, I need to find out some things about him. So let's see if we can do that. And I'm going to use my good old friend Google. And I'm just going to start with the basics. I'm going to enter his name. What can I find about him? Yeah, there he is, Phil Hack. Boom. OK, what can I find out about Phil? Well, here's his information. You have been hacked. Well, this is interesting. It looks like Phil has a personal site. Wow, that's a, that's a treasure trove of good stuff. Oh, well, this is also good, too. His resume is online. Well, if we come in here and look at his resume, well, this is a gold mine for anybody who's trying to social engineer. We see where he lived at one point in his life. We can also see that he's got a Gmail account. Should we ever try and go and compromise that? Inside here, we can see his interests and what he likes to do. Clearly, he's a developer programmer. We can see where he's worked, what he did. Uh, taking a look at his work history, we can see where he's lived for the past few years. And if we scroll down below here, we can get some more pay dirt which is that we know now where he went to school. Occidental College in Los Angeles. Graduated with the mathematics and honors. Very good, man. Summa cum laude. Wow, go Phil. Phi Beta Kappa. So he's a frat boy. And that's great. So that tells us a little bit more about password possibilities. We also know now the year that he graduated. All right, go Phil. Well, if we look up here at this link, then this tells us something we already know. And if we hover over it, it tells us, hey, this is my blog. Great, thanks. Let's go over to the blog and see what we can find out about him. And there's a lot of good stuff in here, including a little about Phil. Uh, we can head over to the about page and find out that Phil's got a kid. How cute is that kid? All right, so Phil's got at least one kid. Now we know he works at Microsoft. That's good. And then we can kind of cruise down through here and mine this page for all it's worth. Uh, we know that he likes Burning Man. Uh, that's interesting. So we can come back over here to the main page. And let's go down to the tags. The tags are always, always a nice breadcrumb for mining information about people. So in here, let's take a look. We got lots of ASP stuff, Microsoft, some music. Great. Japan. That's a good one. And Tokyo. Hmm. Well, they're all technical. The only thing that really gives us any hint of anything personal is this tag right here, Japan. So let's go over here to Japan, scan this page a little bit, see what we can find. Mother-in-law. Bam. Where did that go? There it is. I had a mother-in-law's time when I was in Japan. So mother-in-law's from Japan. Well, if the mother-in-law's from Japan, likely the wife is from Japan. So maybe if we keep on looking here, we can find a little bit more about the wife. And if I, let's see, cruise on down here, what can I find? Cruise on down, where is wife? Where it is, wife. 
and cruise down, da -da -da -da, staying with Akumi's mother. All right, well, there's not many people who don't know Phil's wife's name is Akumi. Uh, now we know Akumi, great, so I can write that down. I'm actually getting a pretty good profile put together of Mr. Phil. All right, well, what else can we find out? If we go back to our list over here, what do we know here? We know the partner, child. Uh, we, don't know, we don't know the names of these kids yet. Uh, we should find them out. And let's do that right now. So we'll go back over here to his blog. Let's just enter in, let's see. Uh, hmm. Well, let's see. What do people blog about when it comes to their kids? Uh, they usually don't just blog about their kids. They might. Since I don't know the kids' names, and I put in kid, it could be blogged about any kid. Um, but what people do blog about a lot is a birth of their child. Uh, so let's put that in, see if we can find something about birth. And oh, look at that, one time, whoa, okay. Well, we just hit pay dirt in a big way. So here we can see that Phil's got two kids, Cody and Mia. Well, that's pay dirt. Uh, Yokoyama, that's interesting. Both the middle names are Yokoyama. That's a Japanese name. Uh, you can bet that that would be the wife's last name or maiden name. So Akumi Yokoyama, that's what we know about Akumi. And not only that, but hey, look at this. We have birthdays right here. Well, that was actually too easy. Okay, so we have those things down. And what about a pet? That was the last thing we needed to know about. Does Phil have a pet? And to be honest, last time I was at Phil's house, I didn't see one, but maybe he had a pet in the past. So what we can do is, using his blog's search functionality, come in here, hit search, and, well, he's <laughs> pet peeve with ReSharper. Okay, so that's a small dead end. Maybe let's get a little bit more specific. We can say, well, do you have a dog? And we can find this out. Yes, he did. <laughs> he's got a number of things with his dog. All right, well, let's start with the first one, see if we can find out information about his dog. My dog Twiggy, look at that, bam. Okay, so we have a dog pet name. Well, that's easy. Man, Phil, you're making this way too easy on me. Okay, so I'm gonna stop right here. Now, if this was a normal user and not somebody I know that has strong passwords, they might be in trouble because at this point, being a good social engineer, I could probably go and guess a lot of stuff and see if I could hack into some things, but I'm gonna stop right here. Going after a big target like Phil Hack, as you've seen, is fairly simple. You can compile a lot of information on him. And if he decided to use a weak password, which sometimes people do, it would be pretty easy to break into Hack Overflow, find some data, compromise the site, embed your own XSS all over the place should you need to. However, sometimes it's a little bit easier to go straight to the source code itself and find out information about, well, the database. If you can get into the database, you can plant um, cross-site scripting code into the database, the owners probably will never find out for a very long time until people start complaining. Now, there's lots of sites that allow you to do something like that. If you have a CMS, for instance, that is data-driven with content, all the hacker needs to do is find the database password, and usually when it's hosted up on a public ISP, uh, it is accessible through port 1433, and it's pretty simple to get straight in. So how easy is it? Let's head over to Google Code Search and find out. And, well, what do we know about connection strings? Uh, that's what we want. We want a connection string to a public database. Well, we know they're stored in the web.config. I come in here and I can say web.config. Pretty simple to do. And to make sure there's a connection string entry in there, I can enter a connection string. And I'll hit search. Well, as you can see, I've got a lot of hits. There's a lot of web configs that have been pushed into Google Code. Um, and clearly, if I cruise on down, you can see that, well, I've only got the opening of the connection string. There's probably a few other things I can do to refine this search, and I've actually done that in preparation for this demo, but I'm not going to keep going because I found plenty of passwords. So, if you have code up on Google uh, Code, and you are using a public ISP like Discount ASP, Maximum ASP, whatever, you're going to want to go change your database password right now because people can find it readily. If they find it and you've got data-driven content, they can embed whatever they want in by connecting to your database. Uh, this is one of those tricks that is used by a lot of hackers. Okay, well, what about other sites? I mean, not a lot of people use Google Code um, for, for uh, very sensitive sites. Uh, if I can go over here to GitHub, uh, you can see I can do a search on everything. I can even do a search on code. I can run the exact same thing. Now it's worth noting here that uh, I did just this and I turned up a number of passwords. So to keep things as private as possible, I am of course not going to divulge those things. And to also underscore just how prevalent this kind of thing is, it happened to me three times. And it happened to Scott Hanselman once with Nerd Dinner. We were lucky enough that people tipped us off, but you might not be. 
Well, as we've seen thus far, ASP.NET MVC 2.0 does a lot for you in terms of security, leveraging the core ASP.NET security concepts that we've had all along. But it doesn't do everything, and there's a lot of places where you're going to have to pick up and make sure you're being extra secure. And to show you what I mean, let's take the case of some user input, uh, especially when posting through a form. So what I'm going to do is I am going to create a little bit of a profile page here, and we're going to only work with two things, which is allowing the user to change their friendly and change their email, because we want to be able to have a friendly name to say hello to them by. So what I'm going to do is add a form here on the home page, and I'll do that right now. All right, there we go. And it is a very typical form, nothing fancy. And on here, I am using the HTML helpers because they will help me uh, as far as avoiding cross-site scripting attacks. And in addition to creating this form, I have also created a user uh, class here that I will be using. And inside of here, I have your very typical user stuff and something that probably is not a good idea, of course, which is to have a password. But by way of demonstration, I just want to show you that this is here. In addition, I also have a factory method for going and grabbing an existing user called find by username. All right, well, using this, I can now go into my home controller and let's pull the user out and I'll uh, augment this index action and we'll pull the user out of the database and send it down to our view. And we'll just pretend that uh, we're pulling out the current user. And so I will just say new user. And then in here, I'm just gonna say email equals test all right, so we're sending that there, and we're going to then send it down to the view, okay? Final thing I need to do, of course, is go into my index.aspx, and I need to set it as a typed view page, so I'm gonna copy this namespace right here. We'll go down to index, and then scroll over, and we'll make this a typed view page, just by adding some generic brackets here. I'm going to paste in that, and then put in .user, because that is our model, great. Okay, well, we're good to go. And now everything should just work. And if I hit run, we can see this. It's going to open up our browser and it's going to bring down Steve, test at test.com. That's great. Now, if you're wondering how all of this worked, these are the model binders in action that we covered in a previous episode. Okay, well, everything seems pretty good. However, of course, when I hit update, nothing happens. So let's close this off and we'll go back into our home controller. Now what I'm going to do is to create an action to handle the post. Dot find by username and we're going to send in the ID because again that's going to be a string coming in that's going to represent the user's username. Okay, so we've got our user. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to bind this to the bits passed in. So we're going to say user, we're going to bind update model, uh, and then we're going to use the form and then we're going to set that to a value provider. Again, I went over this previously. Okay, let's ask the question if the model state is valid, model state is valid, then we're going to work in the database and we'll just say do stuff. Okay, well what I'm gonna do right here is I'm just gonna say var uh, stop equals one because I'm gonna use this to set a breakpoint. And let's make sure that everything is going to be working. Uh, and we got a return, right, return. And then we're gonna just do a redirect to action index. Okay, okay, well we're almost done. The last thing I need to do is to make sure that this ID is getting submitted by our form. So what I'm going to do in here is I am going to change this uh, to have an HTML dot hidden. And in here, I'm just going to set this to ID. And then let's just set this to, oh, some user. Good. Okay. Actually, we'll set this to Steve. Why not? All right, good. So now that we have the ID coming in, it'll bind properly. It's exactly as we need. So let's run this and see how it works. We hit update. Great, and it stops, and let's come in here and make sure everything is good. Great, username is Steve, that's what we wanna see. Friendly is Steve, email is test, test.com, all good. Well, let's run this a little bit more, make sure that this is binding the way it should be, and I hit update, and I come in here, and again, check that the user is working out. Great, Steve, Steve B's, test, test.com. Everything is working out pretty good. All right, well, let's put our black hat on, shall we? And what I'm going to do now, let's just run this one more time. I'm going to open up this form in view source. Take a look down below to see what I can do here. And if I view the source inside here, I can see that I have a couple of things that I can mess with. Look at this, ID. Hmm, Steve, that looks like a username to me. ID, interesting, okay. Friendly email, well, I wonder if this is going against some sort of database somewhere. Let's see if we can have some fun. And the way that I can have some fun is by copying this out. And the next thing I can do is open up Notepad, paste this in, 
Great, we're still rolling here. Then I need to go back and grab the URL. And so if I go back to Internet Explorer right here, you can see the URL is right there in the top. So we'll go back over to Notepad. Here we go, and we'll make sure that we replace that. Good. Now we're posting back to the original form. Well, what else can I do in here if I was a hacker? Hmm, well, I could guess at some of the fields that might be in that user table. And one of the things I could probably guess is the field password. So let's just drop this thing down. And instead of having, uh, well, we can leave all this the same. Uh, and we can leave the ID. Let's just call this password, because that's probably what it's called. And we'll leave this value empty. All right, well, one of the things that we usually know is that people who aren't very good at security, or if it's a new programmer, or sometimes you look at the site and you think, hmm, this is a little bit, uh, looks like it's done by a person who might not have been programming for a while. One of the things you can probably surmise is that the username to get in to the backend system could be something like admin or administrator or something like that. And what we could do here is set this form up to change the admin's password. Okay, so that has been saved on my desktop. Awesome. And now I am ready to perpetrate my little crime. Okay, so let's go back and we'll close the source and we'll go back to our homepage here. So now what I can do is I can take badform.htm. So this says friendly, it's really a password. This is Steve. If I look at the source here, let's view the source once and then on here just to confirm. Our ID has been set to admin. Uh, we have a password field in here, there it is. So let's monkey with this a little bit and then we'll just set this to poop. Poo -poo. All right, we'll hit update, see what happens. Well, 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 look at that. Let's hover over user and take a look. Everything has been bound. Hmm, it's a little bit scary. The username is admin. This hits the database, guess what's gonna happen? That's right, it's a lot of bad stuff. So what are some of the ways that we can protect ourselves against an attack like this? And the first thing that we can do is to make sure that any form submitted comes from our site. So we can start by using, again, a validate anti-forgery token attribute meaning that I am going to be issuing a token on my form. It better be the same when it comes back. This sort of guarantees that a post coming in is going to be posted from our site. So I'll just say anti-forgery token. This is going to output some hidden information. That's good. Okay, well to validate that this works, let's set our breakpoint again. I'm gonna run the site and let's do this. I'm gonna drop this bad form in one more time and I am going to put poo poo back in there. And if I hit update, now I get an error. Well, that's good, but as an attacker, I'm looking at this going, aha, uh -huh, well, these MVC guys think they're smart, don't they? Well, let's do this. Let's go back to the page and what we're gonna do instead is we're going to, let's refresh it. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna view the source and we're gonna take a look and see if we can find the anti-forgery token and there it is. So, since this session is valid for me right now, I can just grab this anti-forgery token and I can go back to my page here and I can just input this right below because this token is currently valid. Great. Okay, so I wanna do the same thing. I'm gonna come in and hijack the thing and I'm gonna close the source here and I'm gonna come back to this browser. Now, it's worth noting that I have to be using the same browser for this to work. Uh, because the uh, anti-forgery token issues a cookie, a cookie that it uh, analyzes on the way back to make sure that you are the exact same person. Since I'm going to be using the same browser, it will see that the form has come from my browser. All the anti-forgery token is doing is guaranteeing that the person who requested the form is indeed posting the form. It doesn't validate that your form comes from the site. It's something that you need to keep in mind. And to illustrate this, I can say poo poo. Poo -poo -ah. and I hit update and look at that snuck right through everything validated drop this thing open we've got a hole again admin poo poo probably not a good thing but this is the kind of thing that a uh, malicious social engineering hacker would try and do try and hack into the admins account see what they can do to compromise it now it might appear that it's kind of useless that we've just added in this validate anti-forgery token but it indeed is not uh, because what we have done by doing this is to invalidate any CSERF attacks. And I'll talk more about those in a second. So what can we do here in this case? How can we lock this thing down? Well, as with most security holes, it came with a developer choice that probably wasn't optimal. In this case, we certainly do not need to be accepting the user's ID in straight through the method signature. So what we can do is delete this. 
And since the user is going to be updating their own information, we should also challenge them and make sure that they are authorized to do so. Finally, Forms Authentication will take the person's username, if we tell them to, and will issue it as a cookie. So what we want to do here is we want to just say user identity.name, make sure that we know who we're dealing with, and that should work straight away. Now we've locked this down so that at least the user themselves are the ones that we're going to be pulling out of the database. So that's good. But that doesn't invalidate a scenario where maybe on your model you might have something like this. And we've seen this all too many times, is admin. Yes, indeedy. And then a person can come in and just, well, hack away at this until they change some of their own rights. Now that happens a lot. It's called right hijacking. Okay, well, if we want to get around that, there's a couple of things we can do too. And you should get in the habit of this, and it's called whitelisting the post. So when values come in, one of the overloads that we can use here, if I take a look here and right click here, one of the overloads that we can use here, actually it's down this way, here we go, drop this over, is include properties. Include a whitelist here as to what it is we're going to be binding against. So, okay, there we go. Now we've just told when you update, you're only going to update these guys right here. All right, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to quickly remove this so I don't have to get logged in, but what I'll do... Okay, the last thing I need to do, of course, is to update my anti-forgery token. Okay, I've updated my anti-forgery token. Now what I can do is I can go back, drop in this form, and go poo, poo. Okay. And good, we've made it again through the anti-forgery token challenge, but now, now what I can do is I can pop this thing open, and it doesn't see that the user's logged in, so user.identity.name is empty. But the main thing I want to point out here is that password is also empty. So if we were to put authorize back on, then of course we would have been redirected off to the login page. This username would be the current user's name, and nothing but email and friendly would have been updated. Now that we've seen cross-site scripting in action, we've also done some form spoofing and seen how we can use social engineering to worm our way into various situations. Let's put it all together into a fairly sophisticated attack called cross-site request forgery. This isn't the easiest thing to demonstrate. There's a lot of moving parts with it, but once you see this in action, you begin to appreciate the level of sophistication that these black hats are using. Remember, they are always smarter than you, and this will show just why. Let's take a look at the bank of Phil. Now what you're about to see is a demo project that Phil Hack showed at Mix 10. If you'd like to see the whole thing in action, go ahead and watch the Ha Ha Show with he and Scott Hanselman as they show off various ways to protect your MVC2 websites. So if you've ever used online banking, you know that it tends to be, well, insecure sometimes. Uh, if you've logged into some of the older organizations, uh, they have weird rules like your password can't be greater than six characters and can't contain numbers, or can't contain anything alphanumeric, or can't contain uppercase. So in some ways, they're lagging behind. And the attack that I'm about to show you is actually widespread. There are a number of banks that have succumbed to attacks just like this. So let's take a look at the bank's website and pretend that we have been given a tour of their source code, and it happens to be an ASP.NET MVC. Inside of here, the Bank of Phil, we have a controller, and the home controller will show us our uh, balances as well as allow us to transfer some money. So in here we have a single account. We've also locked it down with HTTP POST, which is great. On the controller itself, we have authorized to make sure that only the user who's logged in can perform these functions. Now you'd think that generally speaking, everything is A-OK. -okay. Well, let's run this site, and when the site pops up, there we go, and the site pops right up here. And we're greeted with a login form. That's great, and this is awesome. The bank is so friendly, they reminded us that our username was hacked and our password is indeed password. So what I'm gonna do is uh, tell it to remember me. I'm gonna log in, and inside of here I can take a look at my balance. So once inside, hey, look at that, a million dollars. We all know that Phil makes a ton of money, don't we? And then down here we have the ability to transfer money. So if we drop open the account, we can take a look at who we can send things to. There's a bad guy. I can send money to my bookie and so on. Well, let's go and send $1,000 to the bookie just to show you how this works. Notice the balance is a million. Hit transfer. And once the transfer is done, great. Money has been transferred. Well, now if I put my hacker's hat on and I go over here to view page source, this is interesting. I can come down here and I could take a look 
at some of the form values. Inside of here, I can say, hmm, look at that. Just going to post it off to Home Transfer. I don't see anything here that uniquely identifies me in this post. In other words, there's no uh, forgery token. There's no authentication token that you might see with Rails. Um, and then down in here, we just simply see we have a destination account ID. Interesting. It's a select and values. One, two, three. Interesting. The account IDs haha, <laughs> right there. Well, well, well. Let's see if we can cause some trouble. Indeed, we can. This form is wide open for a cross-site request forgery for a number of reasons. Number one, the bank on the login said, remember me. And if I checked my cookies, I would find a token from this bank. And if I closed my browser and tried to log in, I would find, hey, I can log back in no problem. The other thing that a lot of banks have succumbed to is that the form action, this method is not post, it is get, which is even a bigger hole. But for right now, we're going to go with a post. All right, well, let's put our bad guy hat on, and we're going to remember this right here. We're going to remember these form values. I'm going to copy and paste them into a notepad and see what we can do if we can compromise another site, a very popular site. Let's just say that site is Hack Overflow. Well, this is the site I'm proud to show you that I'm working on. It's our old membership demo, but it has morphed into the new Hack Overflow, and I am working on the personalization features, including... Uh, some social networking aspects and I'm kind of trucking along here and as you can see I've got my form we used to be uh, working on friendlies and emails but that's increased to allowing for an avatar as well as a bio and in there we want to allow for some HTML so people can personalize their stuff I haven't really got around to fully securing it yet and as happens um, we might just park this forget about it and leave it a little bit insecure you think that's rare it happens all the time so right now we have a glaring XSS hole, which is right here. We're allowing for the avatar to be output straight in an image tag, as you can see. Not only that, but we're outputting straight into the HTML, the bio. Okay. So our user, as you can imagine here, we have a few new properties, avatar and bio. And if we go back to our uh, controller in our home controller here, and come on down, we've kind of stripped out. We're not checking on authorized like we should be, although we could. Wouldn't really mitigate any of the problems we're seeing. We do have our filters in here, which is great, um, but we're not validating the form token. Now, we should be, but in this case, we're not. All right, well, let's run this thing and see what happens. If I open this up, it'll take me to the profile page, and right there it's saying hello, and it's trying to show me a broken image. I don't have an avatar. Darn. Well, since I'm kind of evil and a bit of a hacker, I'm looking at this page thinking, hmm, bio, avatar, why is this image broken? And if I view the page source and I come in here and take a look, I can see, wow, well, hey, I think they're kind of uh, got a little XSS of vulnerability. So what I could do is test this. I'm going to just lock off that image right there because, you know, the URL it's looking for is, well, it's just a source equals. And if I close off that tag, I can now append in some more text if I want to. And I can confirm that this works just by putting in some HTML. I don't feel like being too sneaky just yet. So let's hit update and see what we find. Yes, indeed. Look at that. Well, that's not very nice of me, is it? Well, this means that this page is ripe for script injection. Uh, to confirm this, maybe I can come down here and enter some script into this page, see what happens. And if you have a big old bio box like this, it almost becomes an XSS IDE. And so in here, I can simply just put an alert, see if it works. Hello. Now what I can do is just post this and I should see a fun message. Hello, and I do. Now, if I am your typical hacker, I would be absolutely salivating because now I have two things that are working for me. One, the bank of hack is uh, wide open to a C-surf attack. And this site here allows for XSS. And since it is hack overflow, a lot of people are going to be looking at it. And a lot of people are going to be susceptible to what I'm about to do. All right, so what I need to do here is compromise this. I want to enter in some kind of URL here. Uh, so what I'm going to do is, and I'll show you this by popping open. So I'm just going to cut and paste this in here so you can see it, and I'll explain it. So right here is the source of my attack. It's an iframe. It's an invisible iframe. And what I'm going to do is fill that iframe full of HTML. This is closing off that image tag for me. This is injecting an iframe. And this right here is going to begin another image tag with an image that I can use on my avatar. 
so people might not guess that something is amiss. So what I'm going to do is I am just going to paste that into my avatar. There we go, and I'm going to remove this annoying thing because I don't want to say hello to myself every single time. And I'm going to hit update. Great, there's my image. That's exciting, and I got a little blurb next to it, but we'll leave that alone. Now, if you're looking at websites at all and you think, hmm, is this thing compromised? Broken image tags are always, always a, a clue. Okay, well, now what I need to do is enter some evil JavaScript in between these tags. The JavaScript that I'm going to enter is going to create a form string, and then it's going to create the, uh, and it's going to inject that form string into this iframe tag. And then my JavaScript is going to call submit on that form. Guess where it's going to submit off to? That's right, the bank of hack. So let's take a look at the JavaScript that I need to inject there into my iframe. So what I'm going to do is just paste this in. It takes a long time to write this. So pretty much it's a function. It is not terribly difficult to understand. I'm simply grabbing a hold of the frame that you can see I've named Ziggy, and I'm grabbing it using window.frames. And then I'm creating an HTML variable, and then it's just creating a form. Now inside of here, I'm heading off to the action that is back on uh, the bank of hack. And to see this, we can go over here to view source, and this is the bank of hack, once again, the source. And if I come up here to the transfer form right here, home.transfer, and if I look at the URL, well, it's this guy right here, 10537, then home transfer. If I come back over here to my page, you can see that that is exactly the URL I'm passing in. That is where the form will be submitted. Then I am injecting hiddens, dis, uh, destination account ID. This time it's going to be value number two. And if we look at value number two over here, value number two is the bad guy. That's me. I want money. Then, of course, the amount 1,000 whopping huge dollars because I am not a greedy thief. All right. So. You might be thinking, well, what's this going to do? It's it's not going to do much. You're just going to, you know, every time you see this page, you're just going to fire this script. Well, that's not true. Every time my bio is shown, that iframe next to my avatar, as well as this script showing my bio, is probably going to show up. And anybody looking at this site who is also currently logged in to the Bank of Hack, and since the Bank of Hack is incredibly popular, well, they're going to be transferring money from their account to me. Terribly exciting, isn't it? This is how CSurf works. Okay, well, that's pretty much it. The very last line here says, fill frame. That's good. All right, so to make sure that everything is in working order, I'm still logged in. Uh, it fills bank. And you can see that, well, we did a $1,000 transfer before to the bookie, but now we still have $999,000 left. I want to take care of that, transfer it all to me. So this is good. All right, well, let's go back over here to our home page. I'm going to update. And it looks like everything has gone through. Let's go back over here, refresh our page, and see if we've managed to steal some money from Phil. Look at that. Gone. $1,000. Gone to me. That's pretty exciting, don't you think? And so being a good black hat, I am going to try and spread my infected form all over the place if I can. Try and uh, invade other XSS vulnerable sites. Heck, I might even make my own, put it on my blog. Spam some links for the bank of Phil so people who I know are users there might come and view my page. Well, there is one way to quickly stop this attack from happening, and of course it rests with the developers of the bank of Phil. They need to challenge their form submissions, basically ask the question, are you really the person that submitted this form? It's easy to do. Well, it's pretty easy to mitigate this problem, and that is, of course, to go back over to the Bank of Phil source code, and inside of the transfer method, as you can see here, well, we want to do a number of things. We have authorize already, so we need to come in here and make sure we put in validate anti-forgery token, because we want to be sure that the person who submitted this is the person who is on our site, not a person who is logged in somewhere else. Uh, and they're also submitting the form that is on our site that we have propped out with the forgery token. So we need to do that next. Let's go over here to views, and then on index, we can come down to the form where the transfer is happening. There it is. And inside of here, we simply need to just output html.antiforgery token. By doing that, we have now successfully staved off this attack. So let's run this and make sure that we have our forgery token in place. 
There we are. So it shows us the proper balance, and we're going to view source on this, and we come undone down here. And there we go. Here is our anti-forgery token. So now when we do uh, some transfers, we can come in here, and we can say, let's send our bookie another $1,000. Hit transfer. And everything works out as it should. Great. $997,000. But if we come back over to our compromised homepage, the one that has the script injection attack in it, we can go ahead and hit update again. It's the same code, same thing happening, sending off the same CSERF attack. However, this time, we go back over here. We have been protected. The anti-forgery token did its job and protected us from this attack.